Let's start with a question, right? Have you heard of Rheindahl? Rheindahl? No. No. Okay, so some people watching will have heard of Rheindahl. I'm going to talk about what that is today. It's the algorithm behind the advanced encryption standard. It's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. So it's being used to encrypt this video, it's being used to encrypt the connection from, to the server that's producing the video, and so on. It's being used if you're using BitLocker to encrypt your hard disk, and so on and so forth. The list goes on, it's being used everywhere. Why is this one algorithm everywhere? Uh, why are we not using lots of different algorithms, and some are good and some are bad, you know? You know, we, we talk about algorithms from time to time, Dijkstra and stuff. Dijkstra is good at certain jobs and not other jobs. Why is it that everyone's using this one? In the, let's say, 80s and early 90s, there was an algorithm called DES, or the Data Encryption Standard. Now, this was written by IBM, and we can talk about this in a different video. Um, but DES had a few problems, the, mo the biggest of which was that it only had a 56-bit key. You know, you might guess the key about halfway through the search, on average, so uh, if you're doing it at random, so that's maybe two to the 55 operations. Now, at, in the 80s, that was probably quite difficult to do, but it became easier, and actually DES got broken a few times by clusters of computers and large um, dedicated circuits and things like this. So for a while, what happened was we used a process called triple DES, right, which is where it's three times the DES, um, where instead of using one 56-bit key, you use three, and you do DES three times, right? That's another thing we can talk about another time. Um, and, but it's three times slower, right? So yeah, it, it solved the problem with the short key. It didn't solve the problem with the fact that actually it's quite slow. So what we needed was, you know, the internet was coming on board, like things were happening. Uh, encryption was getting more and more important. We need something faster, right? So, so in 1997, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies in America put out a call and said, we want a new encryption standard. So instead of DES, the data encryption standard, we're going to go for the advanced encryption standard. I mean, the name says it all. It's better. It's going to be better. Right? Now, there were a few things that they wanted. So support for, different, um, for a specific block length of 128 bits, different key sizes and things. But the main thing they said was, we want it to be as secure as triple DES, but much, much quicker. Right? And quicker on not just your fast Pentium, but also on your smart card and on your mobile phone. Not that mobile phones were a particularly big deal back then, but uh, you know, on your Nokia 3310 or whatever it was, you can imagine that this in the cryptographic community went down quite well. They want to be, they want to produce cool ciphers. They want to test out each other's ciphers and generate new algorithms. And so it was going to be a competition, an open competition. DES was written by IBM and the, uh, with help from the NSA, shall we say, and was just announced as a standard. This was going to be a different process. We we're going to have a proper competition. Anyone, I mean, I was quite young at the time, so not me, but anyone who wanted to could um, submit an algorithm. It would be sort of scrutinized. And if it was judged to be the best among all the others, then it would be made into the advanced encryption standard and it would become, you know, FIPS accredited and it would get a lot of use. Now, at that time, it would get sort of local use in America. But as, as we've seen now, you know, worldwide use. The initial submission was closed in May 1998. That was when the 15 submissions uh, were sort of finalized. Um, and then we had a, an evaluation period where cryptographers from all over the world could try and attack these ciphers, work out if they had vulnerabilities, how fast they were, and there were a number of different criteria they were looking for, right? Because just not being able to break the cipher is actually not that, it's, it's only one part of it, right? There's lots of things. So for example, low memory footprint, efficient, so not you know, using up too much electricity, too many CPU cycles, Fast, obviously, because that's got to help. The ability to deploy it in hardware. If the algorithm is totally unusable when you try and make a hardware dedicated chip to do it, no one can do that and that doesn't make any sense. So in March 1999, they had another conference where they looked at what they'd found out so far. So they had people talking about whether these algorithms were secure and how fast they were and people had tried implementing them on hardware and had reported how that had gone. Five of them, um, issues were found with their security such that they were not secure enough. So five of them were discounted, and then another five were discounted because of you know, various other issues, like they had the same security as one of the others, but were slower, right? and things like this. And so in the end, this got narrowed down to five. Right? So there was Rheindahl, Serpent, which was written in part by Ross Anderson, who's been on Computer Far before, Mars, written by IBM, RC6, written by the RSA, 
organization who also developed RSA encryption, and Two Fish, written by Bruce Schneier and others, Niels Ferguson, and so on. It came down not just to which is more secure, um, and so it wasn't that we picked the, the most secure one, it, there were lots of things to be, to be thought about. So for example, um, Rheindahl performed very well on lots of different devices, so that was a real positive. Serpent was probably the most secure in a sort of a strict sense of it, it had the fewest attacks make any progress on it at all, and, but it was just a little bit slower than Rheindahl, for example, on software. So lots of decisions. In the end, a vote was taken, and it was somewhere around 80-something votes for Rheindahl, and then 50 for Serpent-ish and then some for the others. So Rheindahl won. Rheindahl was written by two Belgian cryptographers, so Johan Darman and Vincent Ryman. They were obviously in, in the cryptographic community, but you know we had big hitters like um, IBM uh, in, in this competition. So it was in some sense a little bit of a coup that they, that they won. But you know one of the nice things about academia is that if you perform good work, people will notice that work and hopefully you know, it'll, it'll see some use, right? Even if you're just starting out or you're not as established as some other researcher. So I, I, quite, I quite like that. The nice thing about AES is that it is an SP network. Right? We already talked about SP networks in a previous video. And so in some sense, AES is actually quite similar. Now there are some differences, and we'll talk about those in another video. But in general, what we've got is we've got a series of confusing substitutions that make our life difficult of tracking back what we had before and some permutations where we're moving bytes and bits around so that it's difficult to keep track of where the key was and where the, where the message was. Um, and you do this a few times until the output bears no resemblance to the input at all. The way that Rheindahl works is actually it can have different block sizes. So it can have 128-bit block sizes or 256-bit block sizes, for example. Um, the AES specification only allows for 128-bit blocks with 128 or 192 or 256-bit keys, right? and that, that's what everyone had to adhere to. So in some sense, AES is a subset of Rheindahl, but they're now interchangeable, right? one is the other. So when we talk about AES, we're talking about the algorithm that was named Rheindahl and has now become the advanced encryption standard. Is that job done then? I mean, we've chosen this. Surely, you know, computers get faster. Mm. There'll be a point where maybe this is broken. Will there have to be another advanced, advanced encryption standard? Well, I mean, maybe eventually. The, so there's a few, that's an interesting question because, so each of these algorithms had what we would call a security margin, which was, I guess, how much better are we going to have to get at attacking these things to, to break them? And we were a long way off, as far as I can tell. Right? There are some obscure attacks on things like related keys and where, and, but the amount of, I mean, some of, some of them will require petabytes of data and, and of encryptions and decryptions to even slightly beat brute force. Right. So none of these are practical. You, you know, there's no issue of, of breaking them anytime soon. The brute force of key on even a 128-bit machine is totally out of reach. Two to the 128 operations is, is huge. So it would take some 100 trillion years for the world's fastest supercomputer, I think I calculated it as. A while ago, I could be out of date now. You get papers and other ciphers that come along. So for example, there's another cipher called char, char 20 which is arguably slightly faster on very low-cost devices. Right, so there are algorithms that perhaps weren't in this competition that could see some use, but there's a good reason to have standards. They get attacked the most, they get tested the most, they get implemented the most. So you, you soon realise what the problems are, and then you can rely on libraries like OpenSSL that have a very, very good implementation uh, for, for your needs. So in some sense, something would have to really go wrong for us to want to change algorithm because of how established it is, and you know, don't reinvent the wheel is we're taking our 128-bit message and we're just laying it out in this order, like this. Um, and then we're going to start using, doing our SP networks. Yeah, we're going to permute, we're going to substitute bytes, uh, and then we're going to transform this into some way where an attacker can't read what the message used to be. So there are a few different...